Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome everyone to AI for Good's webinar on Can Technology Scale to Feed the World? Well, I and everyone else on this amazing planet certainly hope this can be attained. It is, of course, our sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger, but also contributes to so many other goals here at the United Nations ITU. My name is LJ Rich, music artist and BBC TV presenter, and it is, as always, my honour to be your moderator today. It's funny to think that there's likely to be over 9 billion people in just over 30 years or just under 30 years. That means 70% more food than now needs to be grown. And I don't know about you, but it seems quite ridiculous that we're still dealing with world hunger. The good news is you can help more than you think already. You're joining us, so thank you for that. And if you're interested, the ITU has a focus group you can register to join and influence. I'll give you details of that after hearing from our lovely panellists. So, a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce Ashwin, Ted and Sapana. We're going to start with opening remarks from each panellist to set the scene. Then we're going to expand into a panel discussion with everyone. And that can include you, if you like. Yes, audience. You'll notice a Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Please add any questions you have there and we'll hopefully have time to answer a few of them once we open the floor. And stay on after the webinar and join the neural network for networking afterwards with other participants and speakers. And we'll post a link in the chat for that too. So let's find out what makes trustworthy data and why it's a problem worth solving. And there's so much more to it. So let's welcome our first speaker as she turns on her microphone and webcam hopefully it's all working that's Supana Bhattacharya hello there how are you hello yeah <laughs> looks like you're on a little bit sooner than you thought but we're really looking forward to hearing all about what you have to say about trustworthy AI are you good to go uh yes I am yeah. excellent thank I'll you off and let you get on with it thank you yeah yeah thank you LJ it's a privilege to be here today let me just uh share my screen um I was kind of hoping we would have been able to see the video, but let me see if I can set a little bit of the context uh, about that um, as I present. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, indeed we can. Okay, okay. So, uh, so as uh, LJ mentioned, I, I work in the AI research lab in um, HPE and uh, specifically focus on areas such as data centric and trustworthy AI. And so it is, you know, I find it very inspiring to think of the potential that, uh, you know, large amounts of data and the amount, you know, and the impact that AI can have on uh, these problems in agriculture and food systems and, you know, having a large scale impact on the world. Uh, so as you could see, uh, or rather what you could hear uh, in, the, in the video that we were actually showing a little bit of the work that we've been doing with our partners um, and you know, Digital Green and CGIR. And one of the things that I see as a, as a researcher myself is, you know, there are many different places where you know, we've seen AI models, uh, for example, being used for you know, predicting how crops will grow, uh, you know, at what point uh, you know, climatic shocks might arise or what pesticides to use in a given situation or what kind of irrigation practices are suitable in a given environment or, or what fertilizers to use. Uh, you know, what crops to grow so that uh, you can get the farmers can get the most return uh, based on the market conditions, what kind of practices will have the, you know, the 
least you know the best impact uh, in terms of carbon footprint and sustainable development so the potential is very uh, very large and there is a lot of deep research that has been happening and particularly in the area of precision uh, farming and agriculture uh, you know the we have a lot of really good examples uh, that were covered in the video, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but the key question is, you know, how do you scale the impact of that? And you know, that's the question that kind of uh, bothers us. And I will try to share a little bit of perspective on that. Um, and it starts with partnerships, of course. And so we we had a couple of our partners, um, uh, you know, uh, talking to us there, and, and I talk more deeply about the work that we are doing with them. But we work with several partners, um, and we have, uh, you know, together with. Uh, these partners, the World Economic Forum, uh, Next Moonshot Factory, and several other organizations, we have established a, a global uh, coalition on digital food systems, and that was um, kind of announced uh, last September at the United Nations Food Systems Summit. Uh, but what I would like to talk about today is to go down a little more specifically into the question of as we do these, uh, as, as we uh, have uh, improve agriculture and food systems, how do we really make sure that the benefits accrue to the 570 million smallholder farmers? Um, and these, uh, the farmers, uh, the smallholding farmers are actually producing about 80% of the food in developing countries. Um, and yet uh, they suffer from poverty. They are the ones who are probably most impacted and vulnerable uh, when climatic shocks arise, when there are there is an environmental impact or any kind of disruption that happens. So what is key is, and the key question is, how do we make sure that as we are, you know, building these, you know, using these and immense amounts of data that we are getting from the fields, from the machines, about weather, about soil, um, and then using them to, you know, satellite imagery uh, and using them to build uh, models how do we make sure that those insights can, can reach uh, those smallholder farmers? And really, uh, you, we can see two different perspectives here, uh, and, and we are working with uh, our partners, uh, CGIR, uh, and you can see that they're kind of working with 3,000 partners uh, or organizations around the world doing deep research and you know, doing very sophisticated kinds of research. For example, CGIR has about uh, maybe 500 different varieties of beans and exactly how they grow and what impact they, they have and which ones are, you know, are, are the most productive. Um, they have uh, models on uh, how the crops grow and it's precisely just how much uh, of, uh, you know, of each of the ingredients and how much everything really helps in making those crops grow. And so there is a lot of detailed information that is there. Um, and especially say combining data from the ground uh, on that you're collecting from the field as well as satellite imagery. Um, so we have on the one hand, we have all of these research and all of these models that are there. Um, and on the other hand, we have uh, partners like Digital Green who are working very directly with, uh, with small holding uh, holder farmers and trying to make a change in their lives. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the things that Digital Green has focused on is the fact that it's really important to get that insight and information directly to the people who are doing the work on the farm. And uh, this picture is uh, from one of, one of their files, uh, which is really showing that uh, they, they work with a, about two and a half million uh, smallholder farmers across the world. The majority or large number of them are in India. And 90% of the people that they are working with are actually women uh, farmers. And the question is, how do you really get this information to them in a form that they can consume? So what they do is they work with extension agents um, and they go to these communities and have the community, the people from the community actually develop videos about the practices that are suitable for them. And these practices are then shared uh, with those communities, and then they measure the impact of adopting those practices, the impact on the yield and impact, and is it benefiting the farmers uh, and so on. And that um, you know, has, a, has a huge impact on, on the ground. So that's great work. And so we have both deep research on one side and many different organizations and universities and, uh, you know, and many different 
uh, you know, startups in agriculture are also working in this area. And then there are uh, organizations such as Digital Green who are working very closely with the farmers to bring those insights to them. So what's the challenge here? The challenge is how in scaling is really twofold. Uh, you know, they are working with two and a half million farmers. And as I mentioned, there are 570 million small holding farmers. If I look at India's population itself, and you, you know, we know about 50% of India's population uh, is relies on agriculture. And so there is a question of how do you scale the numbers, but even more important, if I talk to Rick and Gandhi, who is the, you know, who's the founder of Digital Green, he says the problem question is, how do we really get this deep research that's happening um, you know, in precision agriculture, in, in all of these research institutes to these smallholder farmers, you know, how do we translate that research into practice? Because if you can have even a, you know, there can be a huge productivity gain if you're using some of these findings uh, to change the practices that the farmers are using. Uh, and so how do we make this connection? And so, so the challenge is really, uh, the problem is not that we don't have data, we have tons of data. <laughs> we have tons of data that are coming at us from IoT sensors, from, from these fields, from, you know, from many different sources. We have a lot of deep research, but the question is how do I connect that context on the ground? For example, if I'm, a work, if, if I'm a farmer working in Bihar versus if I'm a farmer working in Karnataka, the conditions, uh, the soil conditions, the climatic conditions, uh, you know, the water conditions, they're all very different. Uh, how do I you know, personalize that information and, and make that accessible to them? Uh, and so that's the, the question of uh, this problem of, you know, you have a lot of data, but how do you really connect the people who are producing the data, even people who are producing the models and people who are consuming the data and consuming those models um, together? Um, and, at, and you know, so that you have actually the right insights for the right people. And we see this problem across many different industries. So agriculture is no exception. We see this in manufacturing. We see this in, in healthcare. Uh, we see this in every enterprise as well. Uh, and so we have this project that we're working on called uh, Data Spaces, uh, which is trying to enable much deeper discovery, allowing people to find data that they may not have realized might be useful for them, uh, allowing deeper sharing of the Data, to do that with the right uh, privacy and security and trust considerations in factor, uh, making sure there is good data governance. How do you make sure that the data that you're providing, for example, is uh, not going to result in biased models? So for example, if I'm creating a, a model in agriculture, but I'm ignoring certain kinds of areas or certain kinds of conditions, then the you know many of the smallholder farmers will probably not benefit from it. Um, so that's the, the larger problem, but let's dive in a little bit and see, you know, what can help. Um, so we're going to talk about one kind of thing that can help, which is another kind of data, which is metadata, data about data that helps us understand what the data means. So this picture, if you look at it, this is, uh, you know, this is an imagery of a data set. And can you guess what that data set is? Uh, so this is, you know, soil data, it's information about soil. And, uh, you know, you might wonder why do you have this blue colors in here? So this is really uh, uh, showing some information about the different types of soil and pre precisely in the region of Bihar in India. And this data is the soil types uh, and it is collected at 250 meter resolution granularity. And it is estimated using remote sensing satellite data. Now you don't, you know, how do you use that context and how do you actually get that context in the first place? Uh, also think about the smallholder farmers. So smallholder farmers are, you know, have about less than two hectares of land. So you can imagine uh, that, you know, how many of those farms could be fitting in a 250 by 250 meter uh, grid uh, itself. And so there is, of course, a lot of different kinds of data that are there. Uh, but if you just look at the local localization and geographical spread alone, you can see that some data is particular to a single point. You know, so for example, if you're measuring rainfall uh, and then some data such as the soil type example we had or, or the weather data, uh, they refer to larger areas. Uh, some of the data is actually not fully measured at every point, but you can interpolate the data over certain areas. Some data doesn't seem regional, but as I was giving this example of, of Bihar versus Karnataka in India is a question of if you want to ask, how do I do a, a particular kind of irrigation, let's call it the pot irrigation in Karnataka, uh, where there is, uh, you know, where, you know, there is a lot of scarcity of water. Uh, it is actually a topical 
uh, piece of information. And in fact, you want to communicate it in the local language or, or um, so basically the point is that finding and using data is hard another picture here you can see is uh, that of the imagery on this on the right is of evapore transpiration data which is very important uh, for uh, figuring out it's really saying how much of data is uh, you know evaporating from from the land and uh, from the plants and so basically that is very useful in understanding what is the suitable irrigation practice that you can follow. Uh, so making sense of these data is very difficult and data producers and data consumers um, find it difficult to connect. It's difficult to find what data I need, which is suitable for my model when I'm training data, you know, as a scientist. Uh, it's also difficult when I'm trying to apply a model to find what data is suitable for, for my, my purposes. Um, so let's talk about one example of metadata that could help. And I, I, I already talked about the queue there, which you know, you're talking of this geospatial connection, which is really the ground itself. And uh, essentially that's the common ground is literally the ground itself. Uh, and Ted will talk more about that when he talks about the work that we're doing with AgStack uh, to see that how do you actually can recognize these geographical entities, um, associate that with these kind of polygon information that could be used to um, identify that area and then associate and overlay all kinds of data that are relevant for that particular area. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the thing is that we, the, the, this, this needs to be done in a very privacy sensitive and secure manner. And maybe Ted will talk more about uh, how we are solving that problem with AgStack. But that's one example of uh, how just one piece of metadata that puts everything in the common language, in this case, this geographical geotagging and hashing, uh, which is, allows us to overlay these polygons of data, different kinds of granularities. So whether it is soil data or weather data, or you know, what is happening on the ground and the crops and combine them together. Um, and then you, once you have combined those together, then you can always query the data. A farmer can go and probably query or an agent on the land ground can go and query the data that is relevant for that region and then possibly apply models for, for that particular data and geotarget that particular uh, insights for them. So this was just one example of the kind of metadata. Of course, as, you, as I was giving those examples, it's a far more nuanced situation where we have got many, many different kinds of aspects that we need to consider to make the data usable. For example, what, what are the varieties of crop? What are the names that are used for those kinds of crops? Somebody might use a local name, somebody might use a scientific name. So even, even I talked about this 500 varieties of beans. And so how do you really uh, uh, connect, you know, understand what kind of information is suitable for what kind of use case. So, so again, you can add, you can imagine that there could be intermediaries. Uh, for example, as I showed this, this geotagging was actually done, some places is done with the AI help of AI algorithms. So what you can imagine is really the use of AI to be able to generate and associate metadata with data sets that will make it much more meaningful, that will allow us to connect different data sets together. Um, and then that could be used in kind of Two ways, right? So one one could be that you have these agriculture services uh, providers who are the ones, and that could include universities, and it could include many of the organizations such as CGIR or, or Digital Green themselves, who might be using this data and this connections be connection between the data to build models uh, and train models. And then on the other side, you have the, the, the farmers or the extension agents or people who are like Digital Green who are providing that service to, to these farmers to be able to then again find what is the right, right data and right models to apply that to that situation and then provide those insights. Um, and then there is this mysterious box here and I'm going to let uh, Ted uh, talk about it. But if we can do this, we, what we can start to do is by connecting all of this data, this is a step, a small step but it's a step towards making farming better with data as a system. And so um, in summary, um, uh, what you know, I want to say is that in order to scale technology uh, to be able to feed the world, we first of all, we need a global coalition of people and technology. Um, we need a way to be able to connect data producers and consumers with trustworthy uh, um, AI and trustworthy data. Uh, and one of the things maybe uh, that I want to, wanted to add, you know, in that whole loop that I talked about there was, uh, I only talked about 
the fact of consumers getting access to the data and insights, but there is a feedback loop involved. For example, uh, is this practice, and I mentioned that you're measuring what is the effect of adopting these practices on the field, um, and did, did this practice help? You know, did this give, give good returns? So that feedback loop is really very important so that you can go back and figure out that, okay, this model didn't work and maybe I need to enhance the model. Maybe I need to enhance the model with more representative uh, data sets and build a new model. And so that feedback loop, uh, you know, not just to the farmers, but back uh, to the scientists and back to the, you know, to the people who are building the models is also equally impact, important to make that connection. And then it's also important, uh, you know, we say, say trustworthy, I talked about bias and I was talking about privacy sensitivity. Another aspect of this is also explainability. So can we, when we are giving these recommendations uh, to a farmer, can we explain why those recommendations were there you know why did the model suggest that they do that what was the data that was used to to, to do that and you know and uh, that makes us it makes us a lot more reliable and, and useful um, and the heart of this is to have mechanisms by which we can have this metadata driven interaction between data producers and consumers and use ai itself to figure out how to extract the metadata and how to better even pick the data sets and connect the data sets that would be used for AI in the first place. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Sapana. You'll be staying on for questions alongside our other panelists, and I can see some coming in from the audience already. Thank you so much. Please get them in those Q&As there, and we are really quite privileged to be able to answer them. In the meantime, we have managed to find the pictures that go with the sound of the video we promised. So we're going to run those three minutes, those three rather beautiful minutes, just ahead of our next speaker. Off we go. Let's see if it works. Ending hunger is a systemic issue linked to poverty, health, and climate. It's an issue we see most acutely in Africa. To solve it, we'll need complex data analytics, systems thinking, and global partnerships. And we need to act now. We need to be able to monitor and predict what kinds of shocks will be coming, where crops will be suitable to grow, what kinds of varieties of crops we need, or you know, people's livelihoods will be sort of pulled out right from under them. Because these problems are so complex, it's going to take a coalition of people and technology to make an impact. Organizations like NGOs, the Consortium for Global International Agriculture Research, CGIR, private industry, governments, policymakers, and of course, farmers that are actually producing the food. At Digital Green, our work really starts with small-scale farming communities themselves because they are the majority of our source of food. 80% of farming is done by these farmers that have less than two acres worth of land. Digital technology enables us to measure and to interact with people with very specific information that they might need various types of artificial intelligence and big data analytics when paired with these human relationships can be hugely powerful. The ability to measure things on the ground and the ability to look at things from space and start to put those measurements together that give us the real richness of, of analysis and prediction that we need to move food systems towards greater sustainable, better livelihoods, better sustainable outcomes and so forth. Collecting this data and sharing it with organizations like CGIAR and Digital Green allows them to share data with their communities all over the world. These farmers can use the information derived from the data to help them in growing the right crops at the right time, at the right place, with the right amount of water and fertilizer, and all of that will result in greater production of food. Without scale, we're not gonna be able to solve these huge problems of agriculture and global development. If we can connect the dots with data and information, starting from the farmer, linking it across the value chain to consumers, there's a real opportunity to close these gaps. It's possible to, to bring multiple communities, public, private, nonprofit, 
smallholders, industrial, it's possible to, to come around um, to, to form communities around solving global challenges. And if we want to have a hope in feeding the 9 billion people expected in the world, we have to make a change. I absolutely believe that technology and gaining information and data in a transparent fashion can be shared with those who can benefit from it and combat world hunger. Okay, there's the end of that video and thank you. We've taken a look then at trustworthy data in the context of agriculture, but how can we make those data points palatable for multiple applications and projects? Well, luckily, we have someone who knows a bit about that. It's our second guest who's going to give us an overview on making data more human-centric, something many of us are craving. Please welcome CTO for Data Fabric HPE, Ted Dunning. Hello, Ted. Are you there? Hey there. Uh, I am here. Amazing. And, and we can hear and see you. So that's my cue to let you present. Great. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about that black box that Saparna referenced. Uh, how do we connect these models to the people who can use that data? And uh, that's a difficult and severe problem. Uh, I'm going to be addressing that here we go, just as soon as I get some slides flying. So we're going to be talking here about how technology can feed the world, just like Saparna was, but we're going to be taking a bit of a different angle on it. And in particular, uh, the problem that I'm addressing is how do we connect the dots specifically? That slide that Saparna presented had this missing bit here. It has all of this amazing technology on the left, and it has the consumer in the fields on the right. And, and the consumer may not actually be the farmer. The consumer may be service providers like Digital Green who are working directly with farmers. Or it can be businesses trying to build uh, a data-directed business in agriculture. And the key thing that I'm talking about today is how we get the advanced technology on the left to the practical impact on the right. And so we'll focus in on that. And so we have models. Models are mathematical entities that take data, especially real world, real time data, and produce some kind of answers. Those are built from data large-scale data typically because if we're going to learn those models automatically, we need to give the learning process enormous amounts of data. But then that, that's the part that people in machine learning typically worry about. But there are substantial problems also in deploying these models and updating and managing them. On the other side of it, we have people who talk about crops and fields irrigation, pest management, and things like that, they don't talk about models, data, deployment, or updates. And so we need to bridge that gap by translating that. But there is a fundamental skills and culture mismatch. The people on the left are expert in data, but they are usually relatively deficient in dirt skills. They don't have direct connection to what's happening on the ground, and they certainly don't have it in a global sense, all the different ways that fields and crops are managed. The people on the right, even the business or the NGOs who are providing direct impact to farmers and such, typically don't have the time and often don't have the massive data skills to build, deploy, and manage those models. And so what I want to talk about today is a group that I've been participating in. This is an open source project, part of the Linux Foundation called AgStack. And we're going to be providing, we are providing services. We're managing these models. So we get these models largely from academics. There are thousands and thousands of models that help predict the uh, maturation of plants, the emergence of pests, the impact of interventions like fertilization or irrigation or the natural impacts like rain or lack of it or wind on how plants grow 
on how pests mature and emerge. So we're taking those thousands of models and deploying them. We're also <clears throat> finding historical and predicted weather data. Now, uh, this is a, a great example of the problem that the Data Spaces Project is attempting to solve. And it, it's one of the motivating examples that we have. It isn't just the weather. There are hundreds of different ways that weather data is represented historically. And that data can be augmented with other data sources like radar imagery and so on to get much more precise, much more high resolution, more local information. The predicted information about weather is also available in many, many forms. And sifting through all of these different forms, downloading them consistently, uh, making them accessible to models is a job which if everybody has to do it in the world who is servicing farmers, will have an enormous amount of replicated effort. We also are building a number of services like what we call a land asset registry. In some areas, we will be able to use automated systems from high resolution imagery to delineate what look like field boundaries. But in other places or, or to augment that uh, remote sensing data, we will allow people who have some interest in some land to walk the boundaries and mark out that. Now, what they'll be able to do then is just say, here's a piece of land. They won't say anything that's private information about it, merely that this parcel exists. But that will then allow us to translate between the fields, that's the, the way that people describe stuff on the ground, and the geohashing and the modeling on the left. That's a key vocabulary step. We're also building things like uh, user registry that can be used across multiple services so that people can bring together the different sources of data that they have. And all together, we're putting this into a task interface. That's a technical term. What it really means though, is that you can ask the ag stack services for the results of a particular model in a particular place. And we will automatically or automagically, as we often say it, connect the models to the data to you so that you can build a very simple system. Simple in the sense that it uses one set of technical skills. You could basically the, the app construction skills that are taught in coding boot camps so that you can do, build tools that impact real people without having to develop, integrate, deploy, and manage all of the models that we're managing at AgStack. And because the models will speak in terms of fields and crops and fertilizer or irrigation or pests, they will be in forms that small businesses or technically advanced farmers can use directly. And the external information will also be accessible in this way as well and can be provided to the model as needed. And that can decrease by multiple orders of magnitude the duplicated effort that would otherwise be necessary to deploy these systems. Now, if I'm speaking to my machine learning friends, this doesn't sound like advanced technology. And in some ways it isn't, but it is critical technology to connect the dots. We're happy to engage with anybody who wants to provide this sort of data to anybody. We're an open source foundation. So you can touch us on Slack in real time. If we're sleeping because of time zone issues, you can send us email. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at sign Ted underscore Dunning on Twitter, and I love talking to everybody. And we'd love to help with these things. And so I'm gonna hand it back to Elche and let her move to the next speaker. Oh, thanks so about. much, Ted. Yeah. That was a 
That was brilliant. A lovely primer there on how we can improve the human machine data interface. So what does this mean when it comes to actual farming? And also thank you for your questions. Keep them coming in. We will get round to as many of them as possible today. Um, so let's hear a little bit about some real life use cases. And that's what our third speaker is going to do. He's going to show us around. Please welcome the leader for emerging technologies from HPE, Ashwin Pendiala. Hello there, Ashwin. You can you can hear me and see me okay? Oh, absolutely, yes. And thank you, Edu, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Right. I can hear and see you as well. So I'll just pop off and let you do your thing. Perfect. Uh, now, like uh, LJ mentioned, right, uh, the intent of my uh, current presentation would be to give you a real life example of how, uh, you know, HPE, uh, you know, coordinated with a bunch of farmers from a small village who have no access to power, water, or, you know, for that matter, great internet connectivity either. Uh, right, and I'm going to be spending the next 10 minutes or so just to give you an understanding of how did we make uh, you know, it happen in terms of having all of these different stakeholders, right, from the technology, the farmers and the student community. And it'll be interesting to understand what role that the students and the local community play in this engagement. Now, there were three major stakeholders in our engagement, the first one being a Hewlett Private Enterprise ourselves, uh, where the intent was to understand and help accelerate the transformation of agriculture through uh, you know, innovative application of technology. Uh, then came uh, the students. Now, the takeaway for the students from here uh, or from this engagement was to understand how can they broaden the skill set. Uh, they're also interested in some real-time exposure and then probably showcase their experience to the other communities and other students. And then came the main uh, stakeholders here. Those are the farmers themselves. Uh, for the farmers, uh, let me first talk about the kind of farmers we chose to work with. Uh, like Ted and Super now mentioned and highlighted, 80% of the cultivation happens uh, you know, with the small holding farmers and the farmers here are also from the same demographics and, and category. Uh, their interest was to understand how do we they take a soil map decision? How can they uh, you know, take a weather-based decision, right? And so on and so forth, but basically, how do they really take advantage of this data-driven agriculture? With that in mind, uh, when we started off, we didn't know what are we going to be targeting. Our intent was to have these eight different KPIs and uh, we, are, we were only hoping to have some kind of an impact on the eight KPIs, which you see on my screen. Uh, having said that, by the conclusion of this engagement, we were able to see some drastic understanding and uh, you know, uh, some huge delta in terms of the impact we were able to cause here, yeah, right? Like, as you see, we were able to uh, help increase the height of the plant by 35% from the previous crop, right? The number of fruits, in this case, it was tomato, right? Uh, we were able to increase the production by 66%. And there are so many other stuff, but uh, basically the farmer's intent at the beginning was to understand how can we produce more with less, more of produce in terms of tomatoes themselves and less in terms of the investments investments in form of pesticides, investment in form of the power consumption uh, or the water consumption and so on and so forth. And you would see uh, how did we make that happen. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm going to spend some 30 seconds to give you an understanding of what was the high level architecture we had in place. Uh, there were these uh, sub gigahertz wireless sensors. Uh, we call that weather station because that was a stack of all these sensors put together in, on the field itself. They then talk with the gateway, which pushes the data over Wi-Fi to our um, you know, onshore or on-prem data center, which is pretty much just a, a, you know, a computer. Because keep in mind that the, the land which we chose was only between 2 to 2.5 acres and not more than that. Um, and then we also had Azure uh, here, and you would know uh, soon about what did we do with Azure. Uh, and we also had this connected with uh, the water a tanker or, or which is then connected with the drip irrigation of the solar night bulbs because uh, it was important that all these data driven inputs or, or uh, indicators should really talk about or should govern what amount of water should be used at what point in time. Uh, now these are the modules that I just so that you understand you know and you were able to visualize what did we do there so the, these are the actual plans with actual implementation of these uh, you know sensors and gateways. And, and these are some pictures around how you know we collected uh, 
you know, the pictures just to understand uh, if we were to do that at a community level, how do you want to probably then extrapolate it? The idea of this engagement was not to contain itself to 2.5 acres, but to understand if in the future we were to do it for large community farming, how do we then enable drone-based video analytics and, and so on and so forth. So we tried to prototype this particular engagement for other purposes too. And this was all uh, done by the students and you'll see them uh, in a bit. I understand the my current screen probably is too, uh, you know, too small for you to be uh, understanding what we've done there. These are some basic um, you know, dashboards which help them understand at what point uh, should they be watering? How much should they be watering? What kind of pesticide should be used here, et cetera? Now, if you see carefully, uh, all right, uh, the the action here on this particular uh, screen on the, on the right is where, let me use my laser, that would probably help. Yeah, now in this dashboard, uh, if you see, we have the different KPIs which are actually collected from the ground. Uh, right, and the current understanding of what the value is. And it'll also give you an alert as and when required. Now, in this case, when the soil temperature uh, was excess, there is an actual recommendation or an alert uh, sent to the farmer. And this was also triggered uh, through an SMS. So uh, the students and the farmers, uh, right, there was a duration during which the students are, are also from the local community help the farmers to understand how do they interpret a particular SMS? How do they interpret a particular notification on their mobiles and they were you know, able to then action accordingly. Uh, now, not all farmers are the ones who are able to understand and interpret the SMS. But so what we did was we gave them uh, some, some codes to understand, okay, this is the point where you should be uh, you know, taking action on this particular KPI. Uh, if it is water, you will see uh, SMS of this kind with this template, and it would also include what amount of water should you should really be uh, letting into the crop. Um, or if you go to the next one, uh, we also had an agronomist from from the government uh, on board uh, with us in this engagement. Just so I know, in India we have uh, you know the government also actually helping or trying to help uh, quite a bit of farmers in in their uh, you know pursuit of trying to grow more with less and they have been and we, we are lucky to also have complete support from the government reps where uh, they were also manning few of these dashboards which you know while the data is real time not necessarily all the actions have to be real time as well so uh, they took the time well, they understood the reports and gave a recommendation back um, and, and the reason why we had to do this remote kind of uh, an engagement with the agronomist also is the fact that uh, the field we chose is not really accessible to uh, the main city or the mainlands where you have people or we don't have agronomists so many in number that they can really monitor and give the help to all, all the farmers at the same time. So we were able to have an agronomist from a nodal point who was able to you know, give these recommendations. Um, now, coming to the student's background himself, right? Uh, and it, it's important to understand that typically, uh, you know, the students from the communities may not be really having uh, you know, the real time exposure like uh, in the towns on the cities, uh, but they definitely have a very good background of uh, the, the farming community and the agriculture background is pretty strong in, with them. And that's their, that's the advantage uh, we had with them. Uh, now, what did we reinforce them with? Uh, the moment the students were with us, we ensured that they were exposed to the technology, uh, right? And also give them some understanding of how did we uh, you know, how do you install a, a sensor, for, for example, how do you check if they're actually giving you the right data? How do we establish connectivity between the sensors and the gateway? How do you check, you know, uh, uh, and monitor them? Uh, and then towards the end, the, the students were also able to not only understand the IoT part of it, but they also were able to really talk about it to their uh, other counterparts and other communities, uh, right? All right. How did we do what we did with the students and local community farmers here is we had a, you know, a very structured training program from them, right? Even before we started working on the field, we started to work with the students, right? Most of it was where it was trainer led. Uh, we had them visit our labs. They visited the site just to understand what does it look like and what do we want to do with that? What is our final outcome or aspired outcome going to be like? Uh, we also then had very specific tasks assigned to them. We had connect sessions and followed up with that. Once they were ready, that is when we took them for a, a very structured technical session. Um, there were some lab activities in, in our campus and finally the face-to-face -face trainings as well. Now, all of this was only to get them ready to ensure that 
uh, there is, uh, you know, a liaison between HPE and the farmers. And that's how I see that most of these tech work which we do and, uh, you know, the, the end recipient is the farmer. Not always it is easy for them to absorb whatever we, we, we curate for them. And the local community students or, you know, the graduates from the local area are the ones we relied on to ensure they're able to bridge this gap and they did a fantastic job there. Now this is the uh, you know uh, uh, you know a drone view of uh, what kind of land did we choose. This is a 2.5 acre land. Um, if you see, it was not a ready-made land. Uh, the entire land is on top of a hill where there were too many rocks, and uh, you know it was not easy for us to start off. Um, and this was at a stage where it was just before the the fruiting stage of it, right? And this was at the beginning where we had uh, you know the land almost uh, filled with rocks and and and. Uh, you know, definitely not ready for, for a crop, and especially like tomato. Uh, that's when we have to bring in some machinery to ensure we are able to get it ready. Uh, once we had it ready, uh, you see, this is exactly the kind of work, right? We, we have to really refill the soil with, uh, you know, with the local soil itself. We didn't want to have a soil which was pretty fertile. We wanted to ensure that, you know, this is as good as any other farmland around this area. Uh, then there was the stage of mulching and, and nursery followed by actual implementation uh, right and with this and all of these are the actual farmers and the producers also of course with them and, and these are the bunch of students we worked with uh, right, along with uh, a couple of farmers but these are the actual uh, people we trained and helped them implement uh, there were of course a few sessions with the agronomists and, and the local leaders just to ensure that there is a you know a very transparent and clear understanding of what we're trying to do between HPE and the, the farmers themselves. This was, of course, uh, the, the the last stages of the food thing. And, and if you see the crop itself, we had huge uh, harvest. Now, while we're talking about all of this, one important thing uh, you know, we, we, we established with this engagement is, yes, there is a lot of work happening in terms of uh, AI and data and other stuff. But uh, the key in element, which probably would be also important for us to cater to is how are we ensuring that the current real-time conditions or the current real-time um, you know kpis are transmitted to to a place where it will then you know uh, understand the right model or, or map the right decision for that uh, that is where iot comes into picture and and uh, our engagement here was more focused on ensuring that with whatever minimal data or key data is required how do we capture and transmit the data for that to be processed and a corresponding decision to be prescribed for the farmers. And, and we, we saw this to be a great success with the first table you saw, right? Uh, we had a huge, um, you know, it was a huge success considering that this was never done in, in this region with this soil and, and with very minimal investment and monitoring, we were able to get a, a huge produce, um, right? And uh, this is the stage where we were trying to help them with the harvest and Unfortunately, uh, you know, after this particular harvest, we are again going to start off this year. Uh, but there was a gap uh, for a couple of months because of, uh, of the pandemic and a lot of travel restrictions. This just started. This we were in first wave when when we were able to harvest. Thankfully, there was no interruption before that. Uh, but yes, uh, our intent was well served with the fact that there is now a bunch of uh, students who understand how do we take technology to the farmers. There are a couple of farmers, in fact, you know, a dozen farmers who understand how do we respond and react to any kind of decision uh, being, you know, prescribed to them or, or any kind of uh, a guidance given to them. How do we, under, how do they understand it? How do they implement it? They really are aware of it. Uh, is this the end? Maybe not, but this is definitely a start of, uh, is this a fully formed solution? Uh, I, I may not want to completely say that, but this has been uh, quite a, an encouraging uh, engagement for us where we understand how is it even possible for us to work with small holding farmers uh, and local community for sustenance and of course uh, bridging the gap of capturing the real-time data for us to prescribe uh, you know a particular guidance or, or prescribe a particular action for producing more with less and i guess that's exactly what we are all looking for uh, today and, and brainstorming on it with that uh, i think i am done I'll be happy to answer more questions. 
Thank you very much, Ashwin. And uh, please let me invite our previous speakers back from their muted and switched off state as we now have time for questions. Those of you who may see the Q&A panel, it's amazing how quickly and comprehensively our guests are writing replies. But I'm going to use some of that as a way to start and continue some of the really interesting conversations that we can spring out of those answers. But first, let me just give everybody a chance to just uh, warm themselves up with a question each. So Ashwin, I'm going to start with you. Could you tell us a little about some real life challenges that you faced? Sure. Well, as we began um, in this engagement, uh, LJ, we had issue with uh, connectivity, connectivity uh, between the sensors and the gateway or the challenge we initially wanted to use, uh, you know, a GPS kind of a, a network, but that didn't work very well. So we switched to, quickly switched to, uh, you know, uh, a ZigBee network. Uh, that worked pretty, pretty well for us. Uh, but and the second challenge we had was where the farmers it was not easy for them to interpret um, in, uh, because there was uh, you know there was an issue with the language and and other uh, you know local restrictions but we were able to pull it off with uh, you know they we quickly realized that the students of the local community should be the ones to really interact with the farmers and they listen to them more carefully than maybe to us who who are meeting them once in a while but it was students who did the magic. Brilliant, thank you. In fact, talking of uh, translating, Ted, can I get your thoughts on this? What does come up when you're translating across languages and cultural settings? Oh, it, the issues are are some of them obvious, uh, uh, but there are also some really then uh, subtle ones as well. Uh, so, as an example of obvious ones, there's dozens and dozens of languages in India alone. Uh, that makes it hard to reach people. But then there are differences in terms of how the, uh, the farms are organized, whether they are group run, whether they are smallholders, whether they are landowners or not, and in which types of crops they use and which types of crops may not be entirely obvious. So for instance, there are 54,000 types of beans known, but there are far, far more names for those beans than there are types of beans. And it isn't always clear which beans are referred to in which way. So uh, the, these, you know, we, we call it language, but it's really so, so much more uh, it, it encompasses normal practices and, and customs as well as literal language. And then there's also technical language as well. The, I, I face this all the time where I want to give what I think of as the answer and people think that I'm not addressing the problem because we have different technical cultural biases in terms of what we think. Yes, I think that Maybe, translates yeah. across yeah. agriculture and other industries, doesn't it? Um, go ahead, Sapana. So I just wanted to add something there. So uh, I was just, you know, as Ted was saying this, I was reminded of the way we used to do language translation before AI, the advent of AI. So we used to always try to translate between languages using rules and using, uh, you know, approaches like that. Um, but with AI, what we are able to do is you, you give it examples um, and then, you know, give it lots and lots of examples in two different languages and what things match. And then it learns the process. And so today, you know, in sessions like this, you can actually have automatic translation going on in the side. What if we could do something similar with these kind of technical or agri agricultural scenarios where there is a lot more language translation beyond just the, you know, human languages, but also, uh, you know, metadata or ontology languages or, or just the terminology itself. Yes, I mean, just from experience, the different names for herbs and spices like dania is coriander, is cilantro, they're all the same thing, but um, it just depends yeah. who you're speaking to. Um, Sapana, while we've got you here, can you tell us a little bit about how metadata quality can become an issue? So that's an interesting point. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, oftentimes we, we try to put the burden on the producer of data to provide metadata, or we say okay, somebody else can annotate and add metadata. And as we were saying that there is, uh, you know, it's very difficult to have consistency in that metadata without standards. Mm -hmm. And 
So the, it's a pretty good question that, you know, if somebody is just adding metadata, what if, uh, and, and we are trying to use metadata to infer as a data of high quality, uh, you know, does it have any missing information or does it have, uh, you know, does it have some kinds of biases or issues like that? Uh, what if somebody inserts uh, metadata, which itself, you know, has, has these quality issues? And I think the same kind of an approach is what we would need to think about because um, this, this kind of goes in a recursive level. So you can, um, the metadata is kind of a hint uh, for people. And so it's, that's why it's probably better instead of just having explicit metadata to have metadata being learned automatically based on what something is actually being um, being used for. And, you know, the kinds of mappings that I was we were just talking about, like the analogy with the language translation example, uh, that would probably lead to a much more robust system. Uh, yeah. Um, Ted, I'd like to bring you in on this because I think we're sort of heading in towards algorithmic bias, which is an absolutely massive issue whenever we talk about data, whenever we talk about machine learning. So are there any things that are specific to agriculture and this area that where algorithmic bias kind of rears its head habitually? Well, you know, that, that it's actually a really hard problem because in many cases we don't know how big it is. And, and that is the problem, uh, not, not that it necessarily is a huge problem, but that we don't know that ignorance of that is the problem. Uh, but yeah, even, even in very, very technical situations, you can see effects of effectively bias. For instance, if you're looking at rainfall, is the rain spread out through the day and out over a region, or is it concentrated into a tiny moment, into a tiny place? I used to live in New Mexico, which is an arid climate subject to extremes. I, I came out from work one day and it had rained on the right side of the street quite heavily and not on the left. Wow. And so if you take averages and predict averages, you would have predicted a small amount of rain over the entire region. But in fact, it was an enormous and intense and destructive amount of rain on the right-hand side of the street. And that use of averages and the inability to numerically handle this intensity is an example of algorithmic bias. And the the simply the use of a single prediction as opposed to an ensemble of here's a cloud of alternative futures makes it very hard to get real on the ground impacts out of the data. And most people think of algorithmic bias in terms of bias of the sort that humans are subject to, but there are all kinds of bias that we may introduce into our systems. It may not be specific to a, an ethnic group or a language group or a locality. It may be against, effectively, a kind of weather. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, we could talk about this probably for another few hours, but I'm gonna try and cover as many areas that we've got in our question and answers al already. Um, I have one here, which is, uh, I'm not sure who to throw this out at, so I'm going to say it to everybody, but what do farmers tell you that they want? And what do you think they actually need? I think this is probably a larger question than, than at the first thought, but I would like to hear what you think. Who would like to go for that one? I think Ashwin and Suparna can give more detailed information, but I can give a more concrete problem. That is that farmers don't talk to me because I'm too far separated from them. Mm. And I'm too, I work on problems that are too abstract. And so somehow getting that conversation to happen at all is a problem for me. Now, Ashwin's in the field in his project, and yeah. it's a very different thing. No, absolutely, Ted. I think, but you did cover, you know, the right aspects there. Uh, from my experience with the farmers, their original, uh, you know, hope, uh, right? I'm using the word hope and not any other word, because when they start off on a particular crop cycle, 
the first intent would be to ensure that they're breaking even with you no know, because they take a lot of loans from the government from the local money lenders so on and so forth for mm-hmm. uh, you know and and farming is the only thing they are relying on right to feed the family to be financially secure and so on and so forth so the first intent and hope would be that am i going to break even by the end of this harvest cycle am i going to have enough of you know some money to to feed my family for the rest of the crop cycle because and to forget that it is from this particular harvest is what is going to be depending on for the next crop cycle as well uh, right and uh, as on today all of them depend on on the rain god for for ensuring that there is enough water or mm-hmm. uh, on on and to ensure that there is no nature calamity which will wipe off the harvest and and that is where we come in right we we should probably be able to help them uh, you know Uh, help them achieve their minimal dreams that's the least we could all do and in the process of course we'll be able to serve the the ultimate purpose or the larger purpose oh that's a really fascinating answer thank you i think there is something about how maybe the small holders can learn from corporations and businesses but the other way round do you think there's some transferable lessons that you've learned from working with smaller uh, small farmers quite quite a lot uh, uh, and J- i must admit that i was not aware of um, many aspects when it comes to the way they they treat pests you know pests not always all pests would require pesticide right and this was quite enlightening to me because in my mind i thought the moment you spot a pest you got to use a chemical and that's not entirely true there are different ways and means to uh, to to address that and uh, similarly when i was talking with Uh, the student community and and uh, right i i had a different perception maybe i'm glad and uh, right that, that i had this engagement because with um, with students coming into picture uh, their curiosity levels and their ability to understand and transfer that amount of knowledge to the farmers were exemplary so i, I think i undermined that aspect of it uh, right, in terms of how impactful that could be and and the students really did a great job there brilliant thank you I can see a question from Asfar Adib uh, that you've sort of partially answered Supana and Ted and this is about the lack of policies and bottlenecks in data sharing. Um I would quite like it if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of bottlenecks that can happen when it involves governments big entities just your thoughts on data sharing as a whole and what you'd like to have happen. Oh um. one example i mean i can just kick start a little bit uh suparna will kick in with some ideas i'm sure uh is that in some countries soil type is considered classified information and not allowed to be shared across different entities uh but that you know most people think of the kind of dirt that's there as how could that be secure information well it doesn't really matter what we think it matters what the government in place thinks because they're the ones who have the word in those places mm-hmm. and the, what this underlines is the extreme variability of of these rules uh we're lucky enough to be early in the process and so we can make a big difference by just taking weather data that either the US NOAA or the European uh whether uh or the Indian Met office produce and and so for instance predicted weather at very tight scale over the next 12 hours is produced by the US government for the entire globe because they can't model US weather without modeling all of the weather uh so that's great and that's highly usable in pretty much any place and there's higher resolution data for historical information available in a few places because we're at the beginning of this sort of effort we can use data like that which is highly highly shareable but the next generation of efforts are going to come face to face with a lot more variability of what can be used and what cannot be thank you um sapana do you have anything to add on data sharing so um I mean I haven't worked directly with the government organizations but um, in back to our partner digital green they are kind of working on with them you know kind of a day to day basis and and they have come up with solutions like they have this uh, smart a uh, farm stack where they actually have these connectors which 
follow this secure protocol to be able to ensure that if you are providing data, then that's actually being used only for that particular purpose and analysis. And the more mechanisms like this that could be adopted, I think that will make it a little bit easier. I think the second thing, and that's why it was kind of providing a lot more emphasis on the explainability and transparency. I think what I hear from them is people would want to know that what is the data being used for and be assured that it is not being used for something uh, that is negative. They might be want to have assurance about the quality of the data itself because the conclusions that you might draw from that. Uh, so the more mechanisms that we can, you know, we can have in the ecosystem to enable these things, um, uh, hopefully that, you know, we would be more successful there. But as, you know, as Ted was pointing out, every government, every environment, things are very different. And so it's very important to work with what is okay and what is not okay in that environment and see if we can still provide some valuable insights and outcomes. Um, and that I think will help um, shape things in the right direction. Brilliant, thank you. Ashwin, I'm gonna bring you in here. Um, how important is IoT, Internet of Things, for data-driven architecture? Well, I think that would be the foundation for, for everything else to happen. Now, if if Ted and Chipurna are not, you know, are not made aware of you know, what kind of soil temperature is there in prevalence today, uh, none, no kind of model would be able to really, uh, you know, prescribe a particular activity or a particular action to be taken at that point in time. A, a soil moisture in my current soil moisture is required to help me understand: should I be watering more or should I be watering less? And all of this can only be enabled with with sensors and and proper amount of edge to core to cloud kind of an architecture, uh, right? Which is then going to help rest of the models prescribe an action. So the first understanding of this would be where we are able to transfer the current conditions and those data points to the right place where only then a prescribed action can come out as an outcome. Yes, I think there's there's been, been some things around for a while where you're able to measure various sensor data yeah. points, I guess, and then yes, automate yes. the response like add more water or turn more lights on. I've been to yeah. vertical farms in Japan where everything is automated. And I've I've also been in fields in just outside Bangalore where people are using SIM cards to phone yeah. the farmers when it's time to irrigate the crops. So I feel like there's a lot of stuff going on. It, it just feels like there needs to be some kind of standardization or some kind of I don't know, make it a lot easier for everyone, like like MP3s have become the sort of the standardized USB. way yeah. to send music around. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that standardization of data sets, ontologies in agriculture. Um, Supana, I'm going to bring you in here. Um, what do you think we can do to address the issues that, that mean that this is hard? Yeah. So I think the problem is that there are ontologies and there are standards. There are probably too many of them. And so it is, it is kind of, I think the advancement in standards is very important. And, you know, for example, if there is a crop growth ontology and that's really useful for crop modeling and for experts in that area. But the minute you have to connect that information with something else, which has a completely different ontology and standard, that's where the problem, uh, you know, starts to come. And I think there is no easy answer there. But again, if I look at the AI world, there is a shift towards what they call, uh, what we call, you know, knowledge knowledge infused learning so you what we really want to do is uh, as i was saying you know if you try to learn everything using ai models then it might take a long time to get to the domain knowledge that people already have and it doesn't make sense to not use that at the same time if you have domain knowledge there is this mismatch of terminology or you know how do you actually make that more flexible um, uh, so so i would ideally like to see how we can use these kinds of knowledge infused uh, techniques to be able to bring whatever ontologies and standards that people are developing, um, but also be able to you know, infuse them into, into the, the, the learning process. I think another thing is also what we call, you know, in, in the data spaces project, we are seeing this in every area. So we have this notion of saying, um, you know, we, we sometimes call this a super metadata layer or something like that, which will, there, there should be certain common things that you need to know about these different 
standards and, and that describe that standard that say, how do you decode that? How do you transform things into that set? And as people are doing that, we sort of learn from that and use that uh, you know, as, as we go along. So maybe some kind of uh, synergy around what is uh, the minimal things that should be uh, common across these standards so that they can be joined together. You know, Just like we thought of metadata to join data sets, what about the pieces that you need to join the metadata together? Thank you. Um, Ted? Yeah, the standardization is good because it makes it easier to have a large scale effect. But I think it's a trap for people like me who, who think in terms of grand schemes and commonalities and such to imagine that we alone can have a huge impact. We can have some impact, but because there's so much variability and because there's so many people involved. This cannot be just a magical one place solution. It has to be a lot of people involved in solving this problem. A lot of people ad adjusting the technical solutions for particularities, but even more people applying these to the realities on the ground. And it is a trap to assume that we're gonna find a magic technological bullet that's going to, to solve all of these things. This is going to take an enormous number of people, but we need to enable and amplify their efforts through these technological means. So we are more a multiplier than an adder in many ways. Some ways we can do this, we can add uh, data to the problem, but ultimately the effect is to multiply the effect of people who are actually doing the real agricultural work. Well, thank we you. We aren't growing anything. They yes. are. It does feel like the more people that get involved, if we're sort of doing it from a collaborative standpoint, it makes things easier. And it's just getting through waves of admin, I think, as part of this too. Um, Ashwin, I'd like to bring you in. In in terms of the small holding farmers. Is it practical to expect them to bear the cost of new technology, things to buy? How, how can we make it more affordable? Sure, so that's a great question, uh, LJ. Uh, no, it is definitely not practical where we expect them to make huge investments. Uh, but we probably, if we could all, you know, if, if not when I say we, uh, the governments, the policymakers, the communities, there is already a lot of, uh, you know, money being spent on farming and improving farmers, you know, way they farm, uh, all we should probably look for is, can we allocate some part of it for community farming? Because not necessarily every two acre land would require, uh, you know, the same amount of, uh, you know, installation or, or configuration. But definitely do some form of a community farming and, and start off at some point, uh, right? And, and it would definitely give us benefits. The idea is, uh, we, as we move forward, IoT is going to get cheaper we will have far more reliable uh, AI and ML and other data sets which we could rely on, right? Uh, is there any work being done in that part is the key question. And as long as we have the support from the government and the communities, it, it could definitely help the small farming farmers without having to invest or, or really spend so much on technology by themselves. Brilliant. Um, Ted, do you think that um, we can just get more people to participate? What do you think the barriers to somebody joining this team would be? What do you think stops people from getting more involved? One barrier that I have is that the problems are massive. It's depressing, it's, it's intimidating, but people can make small improvements by smaller efforts. And so that's a really important thing. The other aspect is that we're applying open source techniques here. Open source is a movement where lots of people contribute to the development of software. But what we're doing at AgStack is an open source data effort. Lots of people can contribute to models, to deployment, to management, to data. And just by providing feedback or attempting to use these systems in the field, or, or taking them to the places where they can have value and discovering what the particular localized value is. And there, there, it is a huge problem, but we can all contribute some if we have particular skills or particular experiences. And so 
I think that the, the real challenge is to encourage people to contribute where they can and not just assume that they can't, that there's so much to do. We all need to do something. Thank and you. many of us have uh, worked in the open source communities. Of course, Ted has worked in many different open source communities. I have worked in the Linux kernel open source community. And uh, of course, that's a community of technologists. But what I remember was, again, there was a very diverse set of environments on which, say, an operating system runs, right? It runs on your cell phone. It runs on these uh, large uh, supercomputers. And the way the, the, the OS evolved to address all of these needs was basically by contributions and feedback coming from people this doesn't work for me or, or you know and doing just a little bit of contribution and you know it seemed impossible it seemed like a down daunting thing that something could really run on so many different environments uh, you know maybe maybe something similar can start to even snowball question, you know yeah even questions and criticisms are contributions people don't realize that yeah, it's like beta testing something. If you send a little bug report, then it can be it can be fixed. Well, yeah. I'm going to ask everybody in turn, what one thing would you like help with or would you like to change in your current kind of projects that you're working on? So I think, Ashwin, I'm going to start with you, actually. So what, what one thing would you like to change or would you like help with? Because people watching here are interested they probably have more influence than they think they probably have some interesting ideas to contribute so you never know you might get someone thinking hang on i can help with this so what one thing would you change or like help with i think i would uh, you know really appreciate help around uh, you know connectivity right uh, i'm talking about connectivity where we don't have the luxury of uh, internet or or, or you know or, or cell phones or, or mobile network for that matter uh, we have been playing around with a couple of uh, network connectivities, be it the Zigbee and other private players, but I would still say we are not there yet. And if someone can help me on that, I'll be really uh, indebted to them. Brilliant. That's a call out for connectivity. You probably have the right audience for that. Um, Supana, your turn. What would you like to change or what would you like to have help with? So um, my my problem, I think, is that when when we work with uh, partners and what we know is how I can get access to understand a lot more of these use cases. So as I said, trying to solve this problem of connecting data producers and consumers, and we have many ideas, many techniques, but a lot of it depends on having a good, rich set of use cases, so that we are also not biased on thinking about the examples that just we see we come across. And for me, I think having that uh, some way to be able to get insights on those use cases, get data sets and get uh, you know, examples of you know, how that is actually being used and what works and what doesn't, I think that would be a huge help. Even, you know, even if we come up with something and then you know, have people try it out um, and give us feedback, uh, you know, th that would you know, really, really make the, the work a lot more relevant. So a bit more interactivity and some dialogue. Yeah, and the feedback. I mean, for research to develop, uh, I feel that if we just do this research with theoretical situations that we think of, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not going to be applying in the real world. So more and more of those kinds of things that we can converge in and you know, get, get, get those kinds of repositories or you know, forums yeah. like that. OK, thank you. Ted, over to you. What I'd love to see is people who are new, people who are new in technology, students, uh, new practitioners, people who would like to break into machine learning or modeling or advanced data systems to jump up, assuming they have a little space in their lives. Uh, I would love to work with them and help them contribute to systems like AgStack or any of the hundreds of open source projects I've been involved in. And it isn't that hard. It is intimidating as can be to get started. But we are a welcoming community at certainly at AgStack. Any place that I am, I make sure that we don't have an insider outsider point of view. It's all everybody's together. And so I'd love to hear more from people who'd like to try to contribute or to just learn more about what's happening. Yeah, it sounds like a 
rather nice idea. Mis mistakes are pretty much part of learning, I think, and a lot of people are fearful of making mistakes or making themselves look silly. Luckily, I'm in a job where I look silly most of the time, but that's fine. Um, OK, I'm going to ask a final question next as we wrap this panel um, before we go on to our neural networking sessions. And this is, again, to everybody in turn. And I'm going to start again with you, Ashwin, because you've been nice and yeah. quiet and patient for a while. <laughs> um, so this is... Um, I, I like to ask a kind of twofold question to give people the opportunity to answer their favourite one. So what are you most proud of or what's surprised you most in your journey doing what you're doing? Well, I think um, I'll answer both. And uh, right. I'm proud of the fact that I was part of this journey uh, where we're all working for the larger cause. Uh, that itself is quite a lot more satisfying. Uh, right towards the end, I, I, I definitely I was I felt really proud and satisfying. And the second part, if I have to answer, uh, I'm proud of the fact that when we started that journey, we were not even sure of will we be able to conclude the harvest cycle? Did would we even reach there? Uh, for, you know, let alone uh, trying to improve the yield and everything else. We were not targeting quite a lot. We were, you know, it was the first time we were. For most of us, we were. It was the first time for us to understand the crop cycle to probably touch and feel the soil, the plants, the fertilizers, the soil made bales, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, the proudest moment during that journey was the fact that when we concluded and we saw the readings, right, uh, they were really uh, you know, impressive. And, and that is what I would say is a success uh, where you're able to work together with not just between yourself and your other team members who you're really used to. And maybe for the last 15 years, I've been working in, in this area, but then once you take technology to the actual, uh, you know, farmers and the students, that that I would say is my proudest moment. We were able to work together with them and get their desired results. Oh wow! Yes, that's really cool when you can see the impact that your work is having. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, Supana, over to you next. What are you most proud of, or what have you been most surprised by? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I, I feel that I, I feel like I still have to have a lot more impact. So I, I can't say that I'm, you know, something that I've, I wouldn't be proud of something as yet until, you know, it, it'll take time. But um, I what surprised me the most is that I, I work in the AI area of AI. And of course, as I said, you know, I'm very excited about the potential that it has. But what surprised me in working uh, with in agriculture, in particular, you know, in, in these use cases, is, is most of the time that the problems are way, way before you get to the stage of AI. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, we have, we have probably sometimes I feel we may be focusing too much on the models and the cool algorithms and all of that, and not really what feeds into it, which is the data and the context and all of this information. And um, in, at one end, it's, it's that one part of this, the data part, and then other part is really relating it to the people on the ground. And that was, I think, a very big insight for me from working with, with uh, you know, Digital Green and really understanding, you know, yeah, how how different it is, you know, how how the challenges and the novel ways that they're coming up with to address those challenges in in that local context. So, uh, so that th those were the two surprising things uh, for me. In uh, in terms of, I, you know, I don't have something that I'm proud of, but I actually have something that I have a dream for, uh, and I really uh, have this dream that we will be able to use the power of AI uh, in that right place where it you know, and not just in the final model, but in the right place of that messy, difficult challenge that is really, really hard, but uh, it's my dream that, you know, we'll solve some of that challenge, you know, in the years to come. Oh, that's awesome. Kind of getting AI in early during the messy problems sounds like a brilliant idea. It's almost like you need to choose the soil and the seed and um, before you get into all the models, but it would be good if AI could help with that too. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And uh, Ted, last but not least, can you please tell us what you're proud of or what you've been surprised by? Yeah, like Saparna, I try to avoid being proud of too much just because that mean, kind of feels like I've done a job then. And there's so much to do and there's so much left to do that I don't think we're, we're there at all. Uh, but I have had an impact in building some communities, uh, and I'm inappropriately proud of that, uh, proud of students that I've mentored, proud of communities that I built that still run 
even though I haven't been involved for years. Uh, and I'd like to have that kind of impact going forward as well. That's a lovely way to end. Thank you all so much. As ever, it's an impressive selection of insights. And we thank you also, audience, as well as panellists and the ITU, for your kind time and attention and all your questions. I'm hoping that I've wrapped some of your questions into our little question and answer session there. And also our incredibly prolific panellists have answered by text as well. Hello, my name access. is Anna. <gasps> yeah. Thank you. Oh, we've got our AI, Anna, who's going to be joining us to uh, end, what's it, to outro, outroduction, introduction, to outro us. But uh, briefly, I'll say, please stay on for the neural networking session. It's free and fun. Head over to the link in the chat. And I promised you details of the focus group FGAI 4A. You can register your interest there and join experts and leaders from across the globe. You, that's you, have a remarkable mind. Why not take some time to further innovative practices for agricultural production processes? And with that said, thank you all once again. And I hope you have an absolutely excellent day or evening. It's time for me to hand over to Anna. She was quite eager just then. So I best let her close the session and start the networking session. And that's over on the Neural Network. We'll see you all there. Thanks very much. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.